everyone, and welcome to Get Outside Kentucky, an online program of the Boyd County Public Library. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Valerie Askren, and I'll be your presenter. If you're not familiar with me, I'm a local author of Kentucky-related outdoor guide books located out of Lexington. I've written books such as Hike the Bluegrass and Beyond, Fly Fishing Kentucky, and Backpacking Kentucky. When the library first asked me to give a talk on hiking opportunities in the eastern part of the state, my initial response was, wow, there's so many great choices. I love anything to do with water, whether it be a lake or a stream or a river. I love the wildflowers in the spring and all throughout the fall, and of course the natural arches, which our state is known for. I'm also a big fan of biodiversity. I love to see a lot of the natural settings that are very different than the ones that I see around my own home. I also like trails where there's not too many people. In fact, sometimes I don't like to see any people at all. I'm also concerned about the driving to hiking ratio. I don't want to drive too far for just a short hike. Sometimes I have kids along, so I'm worried about whether the trail will be kid-friendly, does it have enough eye candy to keep the younger generation involved, and then a lot of times I like to bring my dog Bear. So I'm looking for places to hike that either are leash-friendly or I can bring him off-leash or on voice command. Well, before we take off on the trail, let's talk for just a minute about what you might like to bring along on a hiking adventure. The number one thing you really need is a good pair of comfortable shoes. It could be a hiking shoe, such as the boot that's pictured here in the center. It has a really rugged sole, which is good for a rough terrain. It also has a Gore-Tex liner to keep your feet dry, whether you're going through puddles or a rainy day. But you can also just wear a really good pair of tennis shoes. Anything that gives you a lot of good support and doesn't rub blisters on your feet. Other items that you might want to include are things like some type of power bar, snack, apples, oranges, nuts, and of course a water bottle. A lot of times I think I'm not going to be out for very long, maybe an hour of hiking, then I'll be back to the car. But sometimes I end up being out longer than I think I will, and so it's always nice to have water and some type of food. A lot of times I like to bring a backpack with these things, so I'll throw throw them in my backpack so I don't have to stuff them in my pockets. I also like to bring a phone. Not necessarily that I want to call anybody while I'm on the trail, but before I get on the trail, it's always important to let somebody know where you're going to be and how long you expect to be gone. Sometimes I don't know that when I leave the house. So before I actually start hiking, I'll shoot a a quick text or a phone call to a loved one just to let them know where I am and when I think I'll be off the trail. A lot of times I like to use my phone also to take pictures or video recordings, and a lot of times I even take a picture of the map of the area where I'm going to be, and that way in case I lose my paper map or it gets damaged in some way, I'll have an extra copy on my phone. And then last, I like to bring a lighter. Seems like kind of an odd thing to bring, but they come in really handy on the trail. If you get caught out um, on the trail after dark, it's nice to have a light source other than your phone. It's also great to start a fire if you end up being caught overnight and you don't have adequate clothing and the temperatures start to drop. So a lighter can come in handy for a wide variety of options. Of course, there's lots of other things you might want to bring, like rain gear and a medical kit. And again, all of those things can easily easily be stashed in your backpack. All right, so now that we're ready to go on the trail, where do you want to head? Well, let's take a minute and look at a map of Kentucky and look at where we are relative to um, Boyd County and the rest of the state. Well, I'd like you to draw your eye down to the lower right-hand corner of this slide where it says Pine Mountain. Pine Mountain is a 125-mile ridge of the Appalachian Mountains that forms the border between Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee. There's a huge escarpment that's formed on this part of our state's border, and off of the escarpment falls the Cumberland Plateau. 
So it's kind of interesting, and that is truly the foothills of the Appalachians. And if you look at the water sources, all of them fall off the escarpment down the plateau, including the top. Tug Fork, the Licking, and the Kentucky River as they all travel actually to the northwest as they travel and dump into the Ohio River. So anywhere to the south and to the southwest of Boyd County, you're going to be in fairly rugged terrain, which is going to promise lots of opportunities for waterfalls, uh, natural streams and rivers, as well as, as well as a galore of arches and natural wildflowers. So in terms of today's adventure, some of the areas that I wanted to check out were Carter Cave State Resort Park, Grayson Lake, Laurel Gorge, Cave Run Lake, both the Red River Gorge and Natural Bridge State Park, and the southern parts of the Daniel Boone National Forest. Well, both Carter Cave State Resort Park and Grayson Lake State Park are about 50 minutes away from Ashland. And if you go to Grayson Lake, you may as well go just a little bit further to the Laurel Gorge area. Carter Cave State Resort Park has so many things to see and do. This is just an easy topographical map that I created of the park showing some of the key roads, hiking trails, the campground located in the center, there's a lodge down there um, along the shores of the Smoky Valley Lake, cottages, welcome centers, uh, so, on, so on and so forth. Again, there's just a lot to see and do here. In fact, if you leave from the welcome center and travel just about a five minute walk, you get to the natural bridge. The natural bridge um, is a natural arch with water flowing underneath it. There's a picture of bear in the picture. And what I really like about this natural bridge is that if you stand in the center of it, you can actually look both left and right through the tunneled walls to see light coming out of it. Well, one of the interesting things about Carter Caves National Park, most people think of it with regard to caving or what we call spelunking because of the karst topography that's found there. Karst topography is a landscape characterized by numerous caves, sinkholes, fissures, and underground streams. Well, that same karst topography which created the caves and the rock formations under the ground have also created a lot of similar types of rock formations above the ground where the limestone, limestone bedrock has been easily dissolved by the flowing water. If you take the Three Bridges Trail, you get to hit many of the highlights found within Carter Cave State Park. This relatively easy three and a half mile loop trail begins at the Welcome Center and one of the first bridges that it crosses under is Fern Bridge, which is absolutely one of my favorites. The trail itself follows the narrow bridge that you see pictured here and you don't really see the arch until you crane your head and look straight up and see where the rocks have cleaved away and the open arch has formed. If you walk just about another half a mile, you get to Smoky Bridge, which is another natural arch found in Carter Cave State Park, where the Three Bridges Trail travels underneath it. When I've introduced a little um, terminology, that might be a little bit confusing for a lot of you. What's the difference between a natural arch and a natural bridge? Well, both of these rock structures are relatively similar in that they're primarily made out of sandstone and limestone. But what happens over time is the acidic water, as well as the wind and water erosion itself, has carved away or washed away or dissolved the limestone, leaving the sandstone cap that has formed the arch or the bridge. If the natural arch goes over just land or like a hillside, then we just call it that, a simple arch. But if there's still water running underneath the arch, such as the picture here of Smoky Bridge, then we call this stone structure a natural bridge. Kentucky, you might know, is second in the nation in terms of natural arches and bridge, bridges, second only to the state of Utah. 
Another trail that I really like at Carter Caves, besides the Three Bridges Trail, is what's called the Four Seas Trail. Part of this is open to horses, and then part of it is hiking only. It's about a seven and a half, eight mile hike that makes a bigger loop around Carter Cave State Park, and it features two swinging bridges. You can also backpack along this part of a trail, and there's a shelter um, that you can get a permit for if you want to spend the night. Another swinging bridge is located at the far end of Smoky Valley Lake, and this is where the dam overflow is formed, and again the trail crosses right over the lake. Well, that same karst topography that forms all of these beautiful caves, um, natural bridges, and natural arches also make a perfect landscape for a lot of the spring wildflowers that are found here at Carter Cave State Park. I'm going to give you a minute just to take a look at some of these flowers just to see how many you can identify. Well, let's start in the upper right hand corner. Columbine is a very um, common flower found all over the state of Kentucky, but particularly in the eastern half. It loves the craggy rocks found in rock houses and rock overhangs, particularly where there's dripping water. The columbine that I have pictured here is a common red and yellow variety, but we also have another variety that's a blue and yellow, which is quite pretty. Kentucky is also host to a lot of trillium. This is the great white or nodding trillium, but we also have smaller red trilliums and even a nodding, um, a smaller red nodding trillium. The bluets are always one of my favorites. They're always such a beautiful, cheerful harbinger of spring. Lower left, we have Dutchman's breeches, or as my grandmother used to call them, breeches. And you can see why they're called that. If you turn the flower upside down, the white actually forms the pantaloons of a Dutchman's pants. Then up in the upper left is what we call Indian pipes, or ghost plant. This is a really interesting flower in that it doesn't have any chlorophyll. Therefore, it almost always stays this whitish or gray color, although there is a pine sap Indian pipe that turns more red. And it's a parasitic plant, primarily living off of decomposed wood and leaves. And then the last flower I have pictured here is wild ginger. Ginger is a little bit harder to see because the leaves are relatively large and typically cover up the flower. So in the spring you have to uh, lift the leaves back in order to see the flower blooming underneath. And the Indians and early settlers used to dig the wild ginger for flavoring of, of their cooking. Well, just a little bit um, past Carter Cave State Park, we have Grayson Lake State Park, which again, you can also uh, add an easy adjunct onto Laurel Gorge. Grayson Lake State Park features, of course, Grayson Lake, a beautiful idyllic lake formed um, um, in the foothills of Kentucky, You almost knob type foothills that you can see here in this picture. It's relatively calm, doesn't get a lot of wind, um, and it's a great fishing lake as well as swimming um, and canoeing and kayaking. If you want to see a picture of the map of Grayson Lake State Park, again you can see the long thin narrow strip of the lake itself, um, primarily located in Carter, um, Carter County. There's a campground there. There's also picnic shelters, hiking trails, uh, and a golf course, probably one of the closer golf courses um, to Ashland and Boyd County. There's a short hiking trail that will take you to Lick Falls. However, the hiking trail itself takes you to the top of the falls, so it's actually difficult to see the fall itself. If you really want to see the best fall, which is Grotto Falls, at Grayson Lake State Park, you're gonna to have to hop in a boat, preferably a kayak or a stand-up paddle board called a SUP. It's about, oh, maybe a 30-minute paddle from the boat ramp over to Grotto Falls, which is stunningly beautiful pretty much any time of the year. Well, a short, probably 10-minute drive to um, from Grayson Lake is the Laurel, Laurel Gorge Cultural Heritage Center.
The Heritage Center focuses on a lot of the um, the arts and crafts of the region, um, as well as the music that we can find here in our state. It also has a variety of very short hiking trails. Most of them are a half mile, at the most a mile long. Some of them are wooden walkways, so they're relatively easy for young children, um, including people with mobility issues um, that might want to get out and enjoy nature but aren't up for a rugged trail. The walkways do go to a variety of lovely rock overhangs, and if you go there early in the spring, there's also a lot of seasonal waterfalls that fall off of the sandstone and the limestone cliffs. Well, where to next? We've gone to a couple of places close to Ashland. Now let's venture a little bit further away and discover the Daniel Boone National Forest. As you can see in this picture, the Daniel Boone National Forest runs from just northeast of Moorhead all the way down to the Tennessee state line, down around London and Corbin, um, to an area that we call the Big South Fork National Recreation Area. Daniel Boone National Forest was established in 1937 and includes in total a little over 2 million acres, of which one-third of it is owned by the federal government. In addition to this long corridor, there's also um, another area of the Daniel Boone National Forest to the east called the Redbird District. But most of the hiking trails um, and other outdoor activities that we're going to talk about are found along the Daniel Boone Corridor itself. Well, one thing that I want you to realize about the Daniel Boone National Forest is that it is so rich in that biodiversity that we were talking about earlier that whether you go to the north, the middle, or the south end, you're going to see a lot of the same topography and geography no matter where you are. This is a really interesting map. Um, it comes from a website called Kentucky Waterfalls. If you just Google Kentucky Waterfall map, you'll be able to see this. And what it is is actually a database where adventurers, hikers, explorers, photographers have gone in and tried to map all of the waterfalls across the state. And what's really interesting is how heavy the concentration of waterfalls are found all throughout the Daniel Boone National Forest. Again, that corridor that starts from the Moorhead area, including Carter Caves, and runs all the way through the Red River Gorge, Natural Bridge, down to the Big South Fork on the Tennessee border. Well, in addition to the waterfalls found in the Daniel Boone National Forest, that's also where we find the highest concentration of natural bridges and natural arches. Again, if you Google the Kentucky Arches map, this will lead you to a database and shows the proliferation of natural arches and bridges found across the Daniel Boone National Forest. Again, look at the heavy concentration starting with Carter Caves, then going to the Red River Gorge, all the way down to McCreary County, and then into the Big South Fork. So from Ashland, or Boyd County, what we want to do is travel east, southeast, along I-64. First, we're going to head to the Cave Run Lake, and then that later on, we'll go to the Red River Gorge, as well as the Natural Bridge State Park. Many of you have probably been to Cave Run Lake, a man-made lake that was built by the Corps of Engineers in the 1960s. Here you can see Scott Creek Marina uh, that's located in the upper left-hand corner. Um, in addition to being a mecca for um, private boaters, they also rent fishing boats as well as pontoon boats. They used to rent houseboats, but they quit doing that this spring. It's also a popular sailing mecca. A lot of people go there um, for sailing opportunities. There are a lot of races there and other social events. A lot of people like to go there and swim. The water is exceedingly clear. Um, and just the, the water quality itself is just incredibly beautiful. And Cave Run Lake is also a nationally renowned champion muskie uh, fishing lake. This is a picture of Sarah Terry 
14 years old uh, from Mount Sterling, Kentucky with her stepfather, who's a muskie guide. And she continues to hold the state record um, for the muskies um, caught in the state of Kentucky. This particular one was 54 inches long and 47 pounds. But Cave Run Lake is also known for a lot of other things that might surprise you. There's two beautiful campgrounds there, uh, Twin Knobs and Zilpo. Both of them have a proliferation of primitive camping as well as RV camping and trailer camping um, right along the shore of Cave Run Lake. There's also the Limestone Loops, which is a relatively new backpacking trail that the Park Service has developed. You can ride for about 20 miles, either up on the ridge or um, drop off the ridge and get closer to the lake itself. Uh, Cave Run Lake also has the old Tater Knob Fire Tower, which was a fire tower um, that was in use about 100 years ago. Unfortunately, arsonists came in, or vandals, we're not really sure exactly what happened. Um, they set a fire and burned the wooden structure of the tower. But what's really beautiful is that the metal structure still remains. And Cave Run Lake area, just like the rest of Daniel Boone National Forest, is host to a lot of foraging edibles, including natural blueberries that are found all across the ridges, and a whole proliferation of mushrooms and funguses. Here I have the white oyster mushrooms um, shown, as well as the bright goldish yellow, uh, orangish yellow uh, chanterelles, which both of them delicious, um, lightly sauteed in some garlic butter with just a tad of salt. Well, one of my favorite hiking trails at Cave Run Lake is Furnace Arch. And this whole area, which is on the western side of the lake, um, is just filled with the natural history as well as the natural beauty of the area. Um, in the mid-1980s, or pardon me, mid-1800s, wasn't clear on that. In the mid-1800s, Kentucky was well known for its pig iron production. Pig iron was used from everything from railroad wheels um, to um, household products. And all across the eastern part of the state, we had a lot of these iron furnaces. Well, if you go to the Clear Creek side of Cave Run Lake, there's a campground there called Clear Creek Campground. There's a lake where you can go fishing, and there's also this hiking trail, which takes you about two miles one way. Oh, no, that's actually, it's about three miles one way, six miles round trip to a place called Furnace Arch. I really love this arch. It's not one of the largest arches in the state, but because of the high concentration of iron that's in the area, we get these really beautiful red and orange hues to the natural arch. Well, most of these iron furnaces um, were in existence for about, oh, maybe 50, 60, 70 years. They produced about three to four tons of iron a day, and which required about 34 cords of wood. So most of the forest that you see around Cave Run Lake, which again is part of the Daniel Boone National Forest, was indeed logged in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century. So you're seeing second and in some cases even third generation forest that's come about. But once Alabama picked up their pig iron production um, around the 1900s, most of the uh, iron furnaces in the state of Kentucky were no longer put in use. Well, if we continue down the Daniel Boone National Forest, going from Cave Run Lake and continuing uh, headed to the southeast, or pardon me, southwest, we come to the Natural Bridge State Park and the Red River Gorge. Many of you may have been to Natural Bridge State Resort Park. Um, a lot of people think Natural Bridge is indeed um, the biggest bridge in the state, and it is large. It's 65 feet high and 78 feet long. However, it's not the largest arch. Natural Arch down in McCreary County is even bigger than Natural Bridge Arch in, at the State Resort Park. Again, it's made out of sandstone, where the limestone has dissolved over millions and millions of years of both water and wind erosion. Natural Bridge State Park also has its own history and natural beauty. 
Originally, Natural Bridge was mined. For, the Natural Bridge area was mined for saltpeter during the War of 1812. It was later founded as a tourist attraction in 1895 by the Lexington and Eastern Railroad, which was later sold to the Louisville Nashville, um, Louisville Nashville Railroad Railroad which hauled coal and lumber out of the area. And this is a picture of one of the dining cars that would carry people from Louisville, Frankfurt, Lexington by railroad. They would come to Natural Bridge. They would hike around, explore the area, and then they would go back by rail car um, to their city at the end of the day. Well, after the area was pretty much exhausted in terms of its natural resources, both coal and lumber, the Louisville National, um, Nashville Railroad gave the land to the state of Kentucky, which then turned it into a state park in 1926. They immediately built a three-store log hotel, which stood there for about oh, 35 or 40 years until it was burned to the ground in 1960. It's since been replaced and has all kinds of wonderful things to do. You could easily spend not just the day, but the entire weekend, uh, if not longer, at Natural Bridge State uh, Resort Park. The lake there, as well as the Middle Fork of the Red River, um, both of those are stocked with rainbow trout. There's Hemlock Lodge, there's um, a campground, there's cabins, uh, there's easy hikes, there's long hikes, there's just all kinds of things to do there at Natural Bridge State Resort Park. Of course, if you like rocks, this is the place to go because there are just so many cool rock formations. Some of them are man-made, such as the steps to the right leading up out of Devil's Gulch. Some of them are a combination of man-made um, as well as naturally formed, like the stairs at the top going up to the top of Natural Bridge. Balanced Rock in the lower left-hand corner is also interesting. People have been visiting there for a hundred years and the thing is yet to fall. And then the lesser bands or rings that you see in the uh, top left-hand corner are also interesting. They're very common um, throughout the Daniel Boone National Forest and there's a lot of good examples there at Natural Bridge State Resort Park. And they're essentially formed by iron ore sedimentation that's been surrounded by limestone and in some cases sandstone that has eroded away over time, again due to water um, or wind erosion and those iron bands that are left are called the leaser gangs. Well if you're going to drive to Natural Bridge State Report Resort Park and you don't want to hike you can always take the park's sky lift which brings you up to the top of not Natural Bridge but you're within about a quarter of a mile hike to the top of the bridge itself with some beautiful spectacular views. There's also a private company called SUP Kentucky, which again stands for Stand Up Paddle Boards. Um, they have underground cave, to cave tours um, that you might be interested in. And then lastly, the Kentucky Reptile Zoo is located just a couple of miles from the state park. It's a nonprofit, and what they do is they collect venom for medical research to produce anti serums. They have 125 species of snakes, um, which total over 2,000. So if you're a little squeamish, this might not be the place for you. Um, but if you're interested in medical research and how Kentucky is um, contributing to that in terms of its anti-serum efforts, you might want to swing by and take a tour. Well, if all of this is making you hungry, there's certainly some wonderful restaurants, uh, some eating opportunities um, just outside the state park. There's Miguel's Pizza, which is a nationally and internationally renowned rock climbers um, venue. Um, of course, the area is known for its rock climbing, and Miguel's Pizza has been there for, oh, maybe 40. 40, 50 years, something like that, um, has wonderful pizza. And of course, LA one, there's the Red River Smokehouse, uh, just down the road. And then going the opposite direction from the park in a wet County is the Red River Rock House, um, restaurant, which has not only food, but they also serve beer and wine. Well, if you recall from the map, 
We are now just a stone's throw away from the Red River Gorge geological area. Again, it's all within the Daniel Boone National Park National Forest. And as we talked earlier, if you go to one park, it's really easy to go to the other. So this is a close-up map of the area. There on your lower left in the kind of pinkish, pinkish purple air, um, color is Natural Bridge State Resort Park. But then if you look to the tan area, all of that is the Red River Gorge National Recreation Area. To the further right of that, the green is technically called Clifty Wilderness, but many people mistakenly also refer to that as the Red River Gorge, in that many of the trails actually cross over from one park into the other. So now that you've seen National, or pardon me, Natural, Richard, Natural Bridge State uh, Resort Park, let's go on to the Red River Gorge. Now it's a huge area. Um, over 100 miles of hiking trails. So I'm going to try to narrow down our focus and we're going to look at a driving loop with really short hikes, which I'm going to call the Nada Tunnel Loop. We're also going to make a quick stop at Gray's Arch and then go on to Rock Bridge. Nada Tunnel um, is one of the first places you'll pass through on your way through to the um, Red River Gorge. And Nada Tunnel was built in 1911 by the Dana Lumber Company. And if you think about that, Dana, D-A-N-A, -A, if you simply transpose the letters, you come up with Nada, or as the locals call it, Nada Tunnel. And there is a small hamlet of sorts called Nada that's located nearby. Well, they hired a lot of people to come in and blast this opening, working from either ends um, to build this road through the tunnel. What they wanted to do was to lay railroad uh, track in order to carry coal and lumber out of that area. Well, the original track that they laid um, through the tunnel, the tunnel itself measured 12 foot wide and 12 foot tall. Well, they thought that was high enough, so they loaded their first load of lumber, put it on a railroad car, and sent it through the tunnel, and it got stuck. They pulled the railroad car back out, had to reblast the tunnel, increase the height to 13 feet, until they could finally get the loaded railroad cars to successfully go through. On a sad note, there was a construction worker who perished during the building of Nada Tunnel. Apparently, they were thawing some dynamite a little bit close, too close to the fire, and one of the sticks went off, um, killing the young man. Yes, your car does drive through Nada Tunnel, hopefully coming out safely on the other side as you work your way to the Glady Visitor Center. Glady is really a wonderful introduction to the Red River Gorge. It tells you so much about the history of the area and the arts and culture of the Appalachian region of Kentucky itself. Uh, one of the things that we love to do the first weekend of September, which unfortunately they didn't do it this year, um, but hopefully next, is the Living Archaeology Weekend. This is a great opportunity for kids of all ages, but youngsters really love it in that they have a lot of hands-on activities demonstrating um, the music, the art, um, the cooking, the deerskin cleaning, um, everything that went along with primitive living in the Daniel Boone National Forest. While well, driving from the Glady Visitor Center and continuing your loop, you come around the Sky Bridge. Sky Bridge is one of the easiest, most accessible bridges within the Daniel Boone National Forest and Red River Gorge. From the parking lot, it's literally about 50 yards maybe not even that. Um, it's a paved asphalt trail that leads you to the top of Sky Bridge. From there you have beautiful panoramic 360 degree views of the Red River Gorge. If you want to from there you can turn around and go back to your car or if you've got some energy you can continue and father, uh, follow far, farther along the top of Sky Bridge, go down the other side of the bridge, come underneath the natural arch, and then get back to the parking lot that way. Lastly, the loop will take you to yet another gravel road that leads to Chimney Top.
This is a picture taken by Christopher Morris. Uh, Chris is one of the instrumental photographers that has been documenting both the natural arches and bridges as well as the waterfalls of the state of Kentucky. And I just love his photography. And this picture of Fall in the Gorge has always been one of my favorites. If you're interested in a little bit more hiking, you can take about a three mile round trip hike to Gray's Arch, which is one of the tallest arches found in the Daniel Boone National Forest. You can just hike into the gorge about a mile, or pardon me, into the arch about a mile and then come back out again. Or you can make a longer five mile loop, or you can even make a seven and eight mile loop. So again, there's lots of variety here for lots of different skill levels. This picture is taken by Bill Foltz, also instrumental in terms of documenting the scenic beauty of the state of Kentucky and contributing to the Kentucky Natural Arches and Waterfalls page. And the reason I love this one is that it is this beautiful reminder of how wonderful hiking is in the wintertime. It's wonderful because there's no bugs, there's relatively few people, it's exceedingly quiet, and excessively beautiful. So don't forget about hiking in the winter months. And then the last short hike I wanted to mention, again about another two and a half, three mile loop hike, is the Wonder Rock Bridge. It's the only rock bridge that we have in the state that truly goes over a stream or a river, in this case Swift Camp Creek. And then there's another small waterfalls just upstream on the tributary called Creation Falls. If you go here uh, anytime from midsummer to early fall, you'll see lots of people down here um, hiking, picnicking, kids playing in the water. Um, it's again, it's just a really accessible and very beautiful part of Red River Gorge. Well, just like Carter Cave State Park, the Red River Gorge also has a lot of beautiful wildflowers. Here are some of my favorites of early spring, the dwarf crested iris, the yellow trout lily, and bloodroot. Again, all of these can be found all along the Daniel Boone National Forest. As spring warms up, in late spring, we begin to see the shooting stars, larkspur, Virginia bluebells, the beautiful mountain laurels up on the ridge tops, as well as the jack in the pulpit. Late spring, early summer brings us lady slippers, both the pink lady slippers and the yellow lady slippers, which are members of the orchid family. And then one of my all-time favorites, the flame azaleas that you also found find up on the ridge tops. But don't think that flowers are the only living items that have um, a monopoly on color when you're out hiking. Here's a bunch of mushrooms or funguses that you might see throughout the Daniel Boone National Forest. The one on the left, my finger, <laughs> my kids always refer to as the bloody finger mushroom, which is actually called a stinkhorn. The beautiful scarlet elf caps are an incredibly bright scarlet color, and they're really small, only about the size of a quarter. The chicken mushrooms and the morels are both edible mushrooms found all across the state. The turkey tail are also very, very common and easily identified by the coloration and the shape of their turkey tails. And then we have the jelly fungus. The jelly fungus is also known as the yellow brain or the golden jelly fun fungus, but the favorite name that I have for it is called witch's butter. Well, if this is the type of topography you like, the type of biodiversity which really gets you excited, I want to just quickly show you a few of my other favorites in the southern region of the Daniel Boone National Forest. Whether you're interested in a medium length hike, um, five miles will get you to Van Hook Falls and back, or some wonderful um, bass and bluegill fishing in the Rock Castle River, or even some trout fishing in the rainbow stocked and brown uh, trout stocked Cane Creek. Um, this is an area just outside of Corbin, which is a great area to, to go to. 
I also love Bark Camp Creek Cascades, uh, which is also stocked with trout um, and Dog Slaughter Falls. Both of these areas have become very, very popular, so you're sure to run into other people. Um, they're both easily accessible, relatively flat trails. You can hike anywhere from one to five miles, just depending upon how much energy, energy you have and, and who's with you. If you continue just a little bit further south from these areas, you end up at Yahoo Falls and Yahoo Arch. Yahoo Falls is one of the tallest waterfalls, if not the tallest waterfall, here in the state of Kentucky, and it has a really interesting history. It's a little bit of folk folklore, but also a little bit, um, again, uh, of history here in our state. The story goes that in 1810, Princess Corn Blossom, who was the daughter of the war chief Doublehead and the wife of Jake Troxel, a white man, she and a few other women had a small group of children that were hiding from a contingency of soldiers that had come up out of Tennessee. They were trying to escape the soldiers. The soldiers heard their cries, and as the story goes, they were slaughtered underneath the rock house that forms Yahoo Falls. Although there are, um, there is a lot of testimony that these people were indeed uh, real characters and part of Kentucky's history, there has not been any evidence found to date that an actual massacre occurred there at Yahoo Falls. You can also walk about a mile from there to Yahoo Arch, which is a beautiful double arch, um, which is, again, relatively easy to get to. Um, probably, yeah, I don't know, maybe 30-minute 30, 30 hike there from Yahoo Falls. And then last, some of my other favorites are Princess Falls, who now you know was named after Princess Corn Blossom, and Lick Creek Falls, which is, again, just stunningly beautiful, as you can see the iron banding dripping down on the inside sandstone of the rock house that forms the waterfall. Well, when you're in these beautiful areas, don't forget to frequent your local restaurants. If you're in Whitley City, I always love to go to the Dairy Bar, an old-time 1950s diner. You can eat outside, or if you're too muddy to go indoors, you can bring your dog and tie him up um, to the outside picnic table while you sit there and eat your burger and french fries. They do have a Velvet Elvis inside if it's been a while since you've seen one of those. Or if you're interested more in bourbon, uh, cold beer, and a burger, you can head over to the Wrigley Tap Room in, located in Corbin, Kentucky, just off the interstate. That ends my presentation, Get Outside Kentucky. Again, I want to thank the um, Ashland Boyd County Public Library for having me. Again, my name is Valerie Askren. Um, the Public Library does have two copies of Hike the Bluegrass and Beyond available for you to check out if you want specific directions on how to get to any of these hiking trails, any of the maps, any of the historical references. You can find it all in the book. Thanks so much, and thank you for listening, and I hope to see you outside Get Out There, Kentucky.